us was really that things sometimes go wrong and bad things happen and supply chains are really no exception to that. Just think of the battery issues that Samsung uh, has had with their uh, handphones. Uh, think of uh, recalls in automotive uh, because of faulty airbags. Think of the product delays that Apple uh, has had in, um, in launching new products because of supply issues. So if you look at that, we see that also very capable companies actually continue to have disruptions or quality issues in their um, supply chains. Now the interesting thing is if you look more closely at individual cases, you will see that sometimes such disruptions can actually have positive outcomes for the supply chain in the long term. They can be like a wake-up call, right? so that um, they make people notice that um, the degree of communication, the degree of collaboration they have had is insufficient and that improvement needs to be taken to make the supply chain more resilient and more um, efficient maybe even. In other cases, however, you also have um, increased conflict after disruptions where um, the involved parties start suing each other and where the relationship might in the end even break up. So the question for us was, what makes for these differences in the outcomes? What determines whether a disruption in itself a bad thing in the end leads to increased collaboration or leads to increased conflict in the relationship? Now, if you think about that question, there are um, a lot of different factors conceivable that might play a role here. You have a structural background in the relationship. For example, how is power? distributed between the parties. You have the disruption incident itself, for example, how severe it is. Then you have different actions that the supplier or the buying firm could take or not take. And you also have people, human beings involved, though there might be cognitive behavioral factors um, at play as well. To handle this complexity, we chose a configurational a method of analysis this allows us to look out for unique combinations of factors that we call configurations that in some lead to either conflict or increased collaboration following supply incidents. The last decision we had to take was what is the empirical setting that we are investigating this in and we chose to look at the relationship between buying firms in the US and Europe and their suppliers in China. We chose this because speaking to CPOs across industries, really the consistent picture we got was that this continues to be a particularly challenging setting where you can really see the good and the bad of supplier-buyer relationships. So FSQCA is a configurational methodology. This means it um, allows us to identify unique combinations of factors that in some lead to a certain outcome, in our case, a collaboration or conflict. As such, it is quite different from the perspective we take, for example, in regression analysis, where we are um, assuming A leads to B, potentially moderated by a few factors. So the, the basic idea behind FSQCA is that each individual factor can play out very differently depending on the other circumstances and that we can have very different configurations that still can lead to identical outcomes. This is easy to see if you think, for example, of two firms that have very different strategies. Sometimes they might be doing the opposite of each other, yet they might both achieve identical levels of performance. So in this case, you would see each of the firms has found an effective configuration and effective combination of strategic factors that allows them to achieve the same performance. And FSQCA is drawing on a larger set of data to try to surface such configurations. In sum, we found two different combinations that are leading to increased conflict following a supply disruption and three uh, different configurations that led to increased collaboration. Now across those there are a few common themes. The first one is that it appears to pay out to have a, a relational governance between the buying firm and the supplier rather than a contractual governance. 
So if there is this level of trust and long-term perspective already before the supply disruption, there is a much higher chance that the disruption will be handled in a constructive, collaborative way afterwards. So these are basically no regret moves. No matter what the other circumstances are, these things seem to always be helpful to foster collaboration following the incident. But we also have more differentiated findings. Say for example, um, is it helpful if the buying firm is engaging into collaborative assistance with the supplier? For example, sending experts to the supplier side in order to provide a technological assistance and help fixing the problem. Conventional wisdom would say, how can that ever be wrong? Of course, we should do that, right? That should be a measure that is increasing collaboration. We found, however, that this is only effective if there is sufficient trust in the relationship and if the supplier has already started to work on the issue visibly themselves. If those prerequisites are not given, the efforts on the buyer side might not only be a waste of resources, but they can actually make the situation worse. We have seen cases where the customer offered assistance to the buyer, the buyer rejected the assistance for several reasons, and this made the buying firm angry, emotionally angry, because the supplier had dared to reject their generous offer. So another conclusion you might draw from this example is, okay, then we should probably leave our emotions at home, and right? we should look at this only from the rational perspective. But this would also be simplistic. Because we found that in situations where there is a sufficient level of trust in the relationship and where the supplier has already demonstrated that they are willing to address the issue by themselves, emotional involvement can actually focus attention, draw resources to the issue and thus help with a quick resolution. So the bottom line is we need to take the full picture into account to determine what is helpful and what is not so helpful. In the paper, we provide very specific recommendations on what managers can do in certain situations. If you ask me to sum this up on the highest level, the takeaway for me is really that we should be more careful with advice we are getting along the lines of do more of A and you will be more successful. Because as we have seen in this research, doing more of A can sometimes lead to good things and sometimes lead to bad things. So what I would suggest is if you're looking at successful companies or successful managers that you would like to learn from, pay attention to what are the combinations of factors, the interplay and the mutual reinforcement um, that is accounting for their success. So ask yourself, how can you recreate this mutual reinforcement for yourself rather than just trying to imitate one or two isolated actions that by themselves might not lead you anywhere. So our research really is a first step. It is relatively broad in the aspects we have looked at. For us, the next step will be to look more deeply into the individual factors we found to be relevant. A clear candidate is the cognitive aspects. Right? There um, could be questions around what role does personality of the decision makers play? What role does culture play? Would our findings be similar if both the buying firm and the supplier were located in the United States rather than the US and China, for example? Another interesting question we are seeing is um, temporal dynamics or past dependencies. So is there a build up of collaboration or conflict over time? And what can firms do to break out of this potentially downward spiral and come back on a trajectory that is leading them to better collaboration. Given that supply disruptions are here to stay for the foreseeable future, we think those are very relevant questions for companies and researchers alike. <laughs>